The play on the field, the courts, and the ice is just one part of sports. Behind every game are the people hard at work so we can enjoy the action. They're the owners, administrators, agents, broadcasters, and promoters who bring the games to life. Meet them when you go behind the game with Patrick Klinger and Bill Robertson. Welcome to Behind the Game. I'm Patrick Klinger. And to my left is my co-host, the commissioner of the Western Collegiate Hockey Association, and a man ranked the 516th most successful athlete to come out of Creighton High School, <laughs> Bill Robertson. Where'd you come up with that number? All right. Good afternoon, Patrick. It's, it's in some ranking someplace. Somewhere? Somewhere? All right. All right. We'll take that. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And our special guest today is a good friend, a 15-year veteran of the National Football League. He's a Super Bowl champion, six-time NFL Pro Bowl selection, a graduate of Creighton Durham Hall. He's a very proud graduate. Uh, he also went to Harvard University, where he has a degree in economics. He was the Walter Payton 2011 Man of the Year Award winner. He's a father of eight, launched a successful uh, high school in Burnsville, Minnesota called Unity High School. And he's with us today, Matt Burke. Welcome. My, thanks for having me. I will get right to the questions because this goes fast. Okay. And I have All right. You've been retired now for, what, six years in, from the NFL. You look like you're in great shape. Yeah, oh, well. Tell us, what are you doing to keep in great shape? Well, uh, I'm not doing cardio. I've, <laughs> I've sworn off cardio. I've never been a runner, never will be a runner. Uh, but, you know, just, just trying to stay active. Obviously, my, my lifestyle with, uh, with children, I'm, on, I'm always coaching something. And then, uh, you know, I think one of the things that helped me succeed in football was I do like lifting weights. So I like to get in there, and uh, it's, it's a bit humbling because I'm a lot weaker than, uh, than I used to be. But, uh, you know, <laughs> trying, to, trying to fight the fight and, and, uh, and, and keep moving so my body doesn't rust out. Just a, a real quick a sidebar to that is generally professional athletes, in particular football, after their playing days, generally players are getting a little bigger. You got a little bit smaller. Well, yeah, you know, but it's, I mean, some guys, yeah, I mean, maybe some guys kind of let themselves go, but for the most part, especially linemen, I mean, most NFL linemen, they're just built differently than the regular human being. I mean, these guys, their frames, and uh, I, I had to work very hard to keep keep my weight on, and so to, to lose it after football, really, uh, it, it really wasn't that hard. It was, so I was very fortunate, because it's a lot of fun to try to, to, to eat your way to 300 plus pounds. Trust me, it's, it's a good time. I know all the good pizza joints. You name the city, I know where they are. Uh, but, it, but it came off pretty easily. Matt, you spent 15 years in the NFL, and you culminated your career with a Super Bowl championship with the Baltimore Ravens in, in 2013. But as a kid growing up in St. Paul, Minnesota, did you aspire for a career as a professional athlete? Well, I, I, I did just because sports was, was everything. You know, where I grew up and when I grew up, uh, we just go outside and play. You know, it was, there were no, I was never on any travel teams or anything like that. Nobody was looking at me saying, well, that kid, he's, he's going to be special, right? I mean, that's, that's why I became a lineman, right? You become a lineman because you're not good at anything else. So you're like, right, well, I might as well try this. But yeah, I mean, when I was playing sports, you know, in the backyard or in the street, I was, you know, Kirby Puckett or Kent Herbeck or Tommy Kramer, or, you know, whatever. That's just, that's just what we did. And yeah, I mean, I remember times I didn't play organized football growing up, but I can distinctly remember telling, I would announce to my parents every time I, I, I had a a career aspiration change you know I would announce hey I, I'm gonna I'm, now I'm gonna be an NBA basketball player you know and that would last normally in the winter and then the spring would come around and say I changed my mind I'm gonna be a professional baseball player and <laughs> even in the fall even though I didn't play organized football I said I'm gonna be a professional football player so it was just kind of I, I just I just loved sports you know having two brothers and, and a dad who liked sports that's just that's just what we did and that's what we did in the house you know we watched sports we played sports outside it was just a huge part of of my childhood how about attending after Creighton High School? You went to Harvard University. You didn't go to a Power Five school, <laughs> and then you get end up uh, getting drafted by the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, it's not the most logical path for for a player to play in the NFL to say I'm going to play at Harvard and then I'm going to play in the mm -hmm. NFL. What what what's your opinion on all that? Yeah, well, I I didn't go to a Power Five school because I didn't have the opportunity to. I wasn't a great high school football player. I mean, I was pretty good, but I was a little bit small and. 
Um, actually wasn't going to really play college football at all. And then my, my high school coach, Rich Callick, one day after the season said, hey, there's some schools that want to talk to you. And I had already kind of had my path mapped out. I'd been accepted early at Marquette, and that's where I was going to go. And football really wasn't part of my plan. And he said, well, you want to talk to some of these schools. Like, one of them's Harvard. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll listen to them. And so, you know, because I was a pretty good student and a pretty good football player, uh, that's the combination you need to, to, to play at Harvard. And so I went there, obviously more so for the education, but uh, I loved football. You know, I just, I just loved playing. I loved the, I loved the grind of it. Um, there's a lot of things that just appeal to, to, to me from the game. And so it was a great environment for me because I think that had I gone to a school that was, you know, a football school, like let's say Ohio State or Alabama or something, uh, I don't think I'd have done very well because it's just too much emphasis on football. I think having that balance of football and, and academics is, was, uh, was good for me and, and healthy for me. And obviously it's, it was an environment where I was able to, to flourish. Uh, I like to tell people, parents and kids, you know, not everybody's fully matured at 17 or 18 years old. You know, you can, you can still get better after that, right? And that was, that was certainly my story. I went to college, I got bigger, I got stronger, I got faster and, uh, and, and matured physically. And what makes you more proud? Your um, incredibly successful career in the NFL, or getting an economics degree from uh, an Ivy League school well, like, like Harvard? Uh, you know, looking back, I'd say um, first of all, you know, neither of those things happened without a lot of help from a lot of other people, a lot of love and support. And um, but uh, when I talk to kids, and, and I mean it, I say it, it's it's the degree. Um, one because you know, some no one will ever be able to take away from me. Um, I mean, football was great, but I'm no longer a, f a football player. But two, right? I mean, football was a lot more fun. <laughs> you know, I do like learning, but uh, there's there. I have a few. I had a few classes in college that really uh, took me took me to my limits, and and uh, and it was hard. And it didn't it didn't necessarily come easy at a place like Harvard when you're competing against really the best of the best for grades. And so um, it was a lot harder. It was a lot. It was a lot a lot more work to get to get that degree. And so. Uh, I would, I would have to, I'd have to say that. How about being a uh, six-round pick in the NFL draft, coming out of Harvard, and you're picked by your hometown team? Yeah. Joe Maurer can say that his hometown team picked him. You're probably one of the, and Ken Herbeck would be another. There's not a lot of them out there, in particular in football too. And the Minnesota Vikings take you in the sixth round. You're drafted in 1998, one of their best years ever in the National Football League. Yeah. Um, did you did you think right away that you could play at that level, or what? What was your thought process? I'm sure you were pinching yourself at the time, going, "My God, I'm playing for the Minnesota Vikings." Yeah, the whole thing. I mean, my whole path has just has been improbable. I mean, I'm the least likely person I think to ever become a professional football player, maybe. <laughs> but um, I'd worked out before the draft for the Vikings, and uh, I remember Mike Tice. You know, he was pretty hard. He put me through a ridiculously difficult workout, and. Afterwards, he said, "You know, you did pretty good." And I'm, at this point, I don't even know if I'm going to be drafted. Like, you know, it's I don't know. It's it's still all kind of new to me, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. And he said, "He said, no, you're definitely going to get drafted, but we're not going to take a lineman." So, um, you know, which was n nice to hear that I was going to get a chance to play in the NFL, not for the Vikings. Hey, that's okay. I really was just thinking I just want a chance. And then draft day rolls around, and phone starts ringing a little bit. You know, you're talking to this scout and this scout, and. And the phone rang, and I answered. It was Denny Green, and I knew Denny Green wasn't calling to say, "Hey, we might take you with our mm. next pick." And he goes, "We're gonna take you right now. Are you ready to see your name on the TV?" And it literally happened that fast. Uh, and so, yeah, I was was pinching myself, like still couldn't believe it. And sure, at first, you know, I'm thinking, "Well, gosh, yeah, this is great. This is this is what I want. I wanna I'm gonna play for the Vikings. And I'm gonna play for ten years, and you know, come rich and famous and all that." And then and then you get there day one. And uh, I realized, well, you know, this isn't Yale and Princeton. You know, these guys are, are better. Uh, so when I got there, it was very humbling. And I wasn't sure I could do it. Probably, probably thinking, I don't think I'm going to do it. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm going to make it. But I'm just going to work hard and invest in the, in the process and do the best I can. That was everything I was always told growing up by parents and my parents and, and coaches, my, my good coaches, my great coaches was, you know, just, just just give it your all, best effort. That's all we want. And so that's all I did and just made the team the first year, made the team the second year, and just kept making the team. I've heard you speak at a, uh, another event, uh, the Capitol Club, and you made a statement that John Randall, 
who you lined up against every day made you a, a really good football player. Can you tell our audience just a little bit about that? Well, I mean, John Randall was the was the best there was. I mean, I played with a lot of great players. You know, Randy Moss, Adrian Peterson, Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, a bunch of others. And uh, I think John Randall's the best football player I've ever played with. Hmm. Now, maybe because I, I was going against him every day, <laughs> I have some intimate knowledge. But, you know, John was, was the best, uh, all pro. And every single day in practice, every single play, whether it was a walkthrough, no pads, pads, whatever it was, he was full go all the time. That was just his mentality. He was like, I'm never going to get beat. And so I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody could actually match his intensity. Uh, I could try. But then John was just so good. And so for two years, I never I, – I was a backup. So every day I'd be going against John, you know, getting him ready to play that week. And, uh, you know, for two years I didn't block him. And, you know, I'm living in St. Paul, you know, hanging out with my Cretan buddies, going to the, the, the establishments and – I was like, man, you play for the Vikings. It's awesome. I'm like, no, it's horrible. I'm like, I go, I go to work every day, and John Randall just beats me 50 times. You know, he's undefeated against me. Um, but you know what? You have to, whether it's football or life or whatever, right? You have to learn to deal with failure. Um, you, know, you can't get too down. You got to try to learn from it. Come back the next day, try to do better. And and again, that's not just me, but you know, you've got great coaches around you and, and teammates supporting you and encouraging you when you those times when you when you really need it. But yeah, I, I told John a couple years ago, I saw him when the Super Bowl was here in Minneapolis, we were doing an, an event together, and I said, you know, I said, just for the record, like, I hated you, you know, because you would just, and, and John wouldn't just beat you, right? But then he'd tell you about it, he'd tell other people about it, he'd stop practice to make sure everybody, I mean, he was, he was great, right? Everybody loved Johnny. <laughs> um, I said, just, you know, I, I hated you, and he, and he laughed, and he said, I know, he said, but you know what, that's what the guys did to me when I came in the league. He was undrafted. Right, 240-pound right. yeah. D lineman from Texas A and I. He said that's what the guys did to me, and that's what made me into the player I am. And he goes, so that's why I did it to you. And uh, I was like, wow, you know, it's kind of like one of those moments where you really feel a lot of gratitude. But I said to him, I said, you know, I appreciate that, John, but you could have been a little <laughs> bit nicer. You know, you didn't have to be such a jerk all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, there are many like me who believe that you should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, well, you should be out there campaigning for <laughs> me then, Patrick. What are you doing in here? Get out there. And you would be the yeah. first, if that happens, you'd be the first Harvard player to be enshrined in Canton. Do you ever allow yourself to think about the possibility of going to the, the Hall of Fame? Well, you know, I, hey, a little bit. First of all, I, I'm, I'm in the Creighton Darren Hall Hall of Fame, the, the Mancini's, Mancini's Hall, Hall of Fame. fame. Two Hall of Famers the here. The Catholic today. Athletic <laughs> Association Hall of Fame. I mean, if I could just brag for a minute. <laughs> Um, hey, you know what? I, this is the way I say it. I, I can't ask for anything more from, from my career. I mean, the opportunity that I had, it, like I said, I'm very cognizant of the fact that a million different things lined up just perfectly for me. I mean, you mentioned 1998, which was, the, at the time, the greatest offense in the history of the NFL. Making that team, for me, they were like, hey, we don't need you to play. Like, you're going to basically sit the bench one or two years and develop and watch these guys. Watch Jeff Christie. Watch Todd Stucey. Watch Corey Stringer. Watch Randall McDan. A lot of young guys, they get to the league, and, and teams need them to play right away. And then they get in there, and they're not ready, and you have a couple bad games, you get bad film, you're done. Because they're just bringing in a new set of rookies next year, right? I mean, every, like so many things lined up perfectly for me. So I say, hey, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very – I feel very blessed and, and I'm very comfortable with, with, with my career and you know where it, where it stands. I'm not owed anything. But if that does happen, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, you know, so the way it works is every Hall of Fame or every inductee you know, has a party. Like you, you, know, you rent a venue or a house and you throw the party when, when you're in trying. I mean, I might not, if I make the Hall of Fame, I'll be the worst football player in the Hall of Fame, but I will have the all time best party. <laughs> are we going to we, we be invited? Every, the, all of all St. Paul's invited for sure. We might even invite some Minneapolis people. I mean, that, that's how big it's going to be. All right. Yes. I mean, a lot of people look at you as a, as a football player, but you did a lot off the field. I mean, I went to a few of your events, the Hike Foundation played in your golf tournament, and it was a wonderful. I won the long drive contest. You did one. You beat me in a long drive contest. You, this guy hits it a it ton. The, Chip Lowmiller was the guy I beat out at the Chipper, end. Chipper, yeah. Chip hits it a ton. You guys were, they were, they were long, Patrick, long. But you were, you were also named, you know, the Vikings uh, Man of the Year, but then you were named the NFL's Man of the Year. That has to be right up there as one of the greatest honors for you as, as somebody that's giving back to the game and giving back to the community. Yeah, well, yeah, there's no question about that. Um, 
you know, you don't you don't do things, you don't volunteer, do community work to to win awards. Um, but you know, that's that's just how I was raised. Uh, I mean, you give back. I mean, you don't even give back. You just give. You know, I think that's the that's the best way I've I've heard. Don't don't give back. Just give. And I mean, shoot, when you're a football player, it's so easy to do things. The first my first week with the Vikings, I remember. It was Monday, we had practice, and then Tuesday's the, the day off and you know, before the first game. And Denny Green said after practice, he said, hey, just so you, you new guys know, Tuesday's around here. It's called Community Tuesday. So we get out there and we do something. He goes, if you don't have anywhere to go, go see Brad Matson, Community Relations Director, and he'll send you somewhere. And I was just happy to be on the team. You know, so I was like, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going somewhere. So I went to Brad, and Brad sent me to a school. And even though I was, I was a nobody, uh, the kids just, you know, the kids were all excited, right? Vikings player. And, and uh, I'm not, t I don't know if I'm telling them anything differently than they're hearing from their parents or their teachers or whatever. Maybe some of them don't have, you know, that. But, I, but the kids are, are going nuts, right? They're actually listening to you. And I just, that, that first time, I just fell in love with, with doing it. And as, like I said, as an NFL player, it, it's so easy to do good. You know, you, you have events and people show up and corporate sponsors get behind you. It's like, why, if you can help somebody, why, why wouldn't you? You know, I think that's just... Again, then that was then that was instilled in me at a young age from from my parents, and um, yeah, it was nice to when when you're playing. It was it was it was really nice to, to have that kind of platform where you could where you could do some stuff and and just try to do good. You made the most mm. out of it. For we sure. tried. We tried. Following retirement uh, in 2014, the NFL hired you as the director of football. It's a mistake on their part. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that experience and. If you've ever wondered about becoming commissioner, is, have you ever considered becoming commissioner? Well, if they raise the pay, the I NFL. might consider it. Uh, you know, it's got to pay a little bit more. Um, <laughs> no, you know, as an opportunity, I got invited to go work there, and uh, I thought, okay, well, you know, I played. I was a, I was a union rep. Let me see the kind of the third side of this, which is the league office. So, packed up my family, moved to New York, and uh, yeah, they created a department called football development. Right, like football had developed on its own for. 90 years, but then they needed a they needed a <laughs> department to help it develop. But uh, you know what? Um, it was it was it was interesting to see the, the the corporate side. You know, be inside the league office. I mean, obviously, I, you know, I love the game and I love the league, and, and it was interesting to see to see that perspective. Uh, did it for a couple of years. You know, ultimately for me, just a lifestyle choice with my family. We moved to New York, uh, had six kids, picked up two more while we were there, <laughs> adopted two children, and ultimately decided that's not. You know, didn't want to raise our family there um but it's interesting and i don't know i i'm you know, have, have have i thought about being commissioner sure i you know, i just saw commissioner goodell last week and have very fortunate have a really really great personal relationship with him i got a lot of respect for him uh but I, I've, I've seen that job too that's that's a huge job you know it's one of those jobs that it, it really does it kind of owns you you know in a in a way so i don't know i don't uh, i look at sort of how my life has gone up to this point. I mean, I couldn't have planned any of this, so I don't. I don't really plan too much in the future. I kind of, I kind of go with the flow and, and just. I mean, really, just try to see where, where God calls me. And you know, right now it's it's here, and uh, in the future, who who knows? But I bet if I became commissioner, I bet I could get myself into the Hall of Fame. Don't <laughs> you? I mean, I bet. I bet you I think your odds go up pretty significantly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's what I have to do. They always say, you know, as commissioner of the WCHA, which is not necessarily the commissioner of the NFL. It's it's you're on an island, yeah. and and sometimes you feel like you're on an island because you're the uh, the the chief operating officer and you're the trials and tribulations yeah. of the entire league. So well, I was the commissioner of the Mendota Heights K through four <laughs> flag football league this year and I actually told Roger Goodell that him and I are colleagues now because I'm the commissioner of a football league as, as well. And that's a tough job. I mean you got to remember to bring the juice boxes yes. and you know one kid will forget details. his flags. Yeah it's always the details. It's always yeah. little details that get you Billy. You know that. How about uh, a lot of people say Matt Burke would be a great uh, councilman, mayor, politics. Is that something, I know you have views on politics, and we do not necessarily have to go into all the views, but, <laughs> but, but, but asking you, is that, would that ever be something that would, would float your boat? Uh, well, you say some people say it'd be great. There's probably half the people <laughs> would say it wouldn't be. <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, thought about it. You know, right now it's not not my time for that. Um, I guess you know, at the end of the day, I just try to pass everything through the filter. Is you know, can can I do good? Like you know, right? We only have we only have so much time and focus and energy that we can give certain things. And when I with a large family and a lot of little kids, right? Mine's probably a little bit more limited, so yes. I have to be very 
laser focused and, and efficient, I think, in order to, to fulfill all of my, all of my duties and, and obligations. So now's not my time. I don't know, right? I mean, I'm not a, I'm really not a political guy, but, um, you know, sometimes you, right, you see certain things and you think that the job can be done better and things can be better. And, uh, you know, my dad's, um, he sort of taught me, like, you know, don't don't sit around and complain about something. Like, if you have a problem, you know, do something about it, right? So, yes. I don't know. Maybe someday we'll look into that and see if that's if that's a way that I think that I could have a have the biggest positive impact. But with two three year olds at home, that's, that's hard to do at the time right now. I understand? I think you would do great. You now own and operate Matt Burke and Company. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that company and, and the services it provides. Yeah, um, we're a, uh, we do a lot of uh, keynote speeches, business consulting, coaching, things like that. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, it's just trying to, I think everybody wants to and, and can do better. Um, and so you know, I was very fortunate, 15 years in the NFL, trying to, you're trying to compete with the best of the best in the world. So you're always looking for things, whether it's, you know, just general inspiration or tips on how to be, you know, more productive or mental training or, you know, wh whatever you can to just get that 1% better uh, every, every single day. So uh, do a lot of speaking at, at uh, corporate events, um, associations, things like that, bring in. And, you know, football's a, football's a great, it's a great way to communicate because it's not a, it's not a very complicated game, but everybody, mo almost everybody is, is some, at some level a, a football fan. And uh, so I get to share the experiences that I've had and then, and then tie them to real life, whether that be to, to, to people's jobs and how they can achieve more or just, you know, to, to their lives, how they can bring more, uh, bring more, bring more passion to, to, to what they're doing every single day. Comedy. <laughs> We've seen a little bit. You want me to tell today. some jokes? <laughs> huh? You want me to try out a couple on you? Well, I, I don't know if the audience knows, but uh, Matt has done... Uh, some stand-up comedy routines in the Twin Cities and uh, recently in New York, and he does it for charity. He's not doing it as a, a way to make money, but uh, what about being the next Johnny Carson? Uh, could you, <laughs> could you, could you uh, do that? That might not be bad, right? That would, that'd be, you'd, you'd meet a lot of interesting people yes. and get to do a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, no, it's like I said, that's why I, I'm kind of open to everything and fell into comedy, did it on a dare, didn't go horribly, and I thought, well, you know, like, like all of us, right? I'm involved with different causes, and I thought, well, this could be a, yeah, I'm doing this thing. There's 500 people here. This is a pretty easy fundraising model. You know, there's no, there's no chicken dinners or anything. You got to do. You just people walk in and you get up on the stage and tell jokes. And so yeah, did it like that, and then got picked up by a, by a national tour. Did a few dates and tried it out outside of Minnesota, which is a little scary. But one of those things that. Um, it's uh, right, kind of scares the heck out of you. Yeah. So that's that's good, right? That's that's where, when you get uncomfortable, that's where personal growth happens. I don't foresee myself becoming uh, a, a very successful a successful comic, but it's been a great experience, and, and I'm, I am uh, proud to say that, that we have raised a couple hundred thousand dollars for charities using using that model. So it's uh, so it's a good thing. It's great. What was scarier? Uh, standing on stage telling jokes or playing in the uh, Super Bowl? Uh, I'll tell you what, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, it, it really is. You know, they say, gosh, that, that seems like it'd be the scariest thing ever. And, mm -hmm. and it is. I mean, you walk out on stage and everyone's just kind of sitting there with their arms crossed saying, all right, make me laugh, <laughs> funny man. I mean, you know, you start getting the sweats behind your knees and, and you tell a joke and you think it's going to, you think it's going to crush and it doesn't. You're like, whoa, um, that's, that's a, that's a that's a panic, and I mean, I would I would say comedy because football, you know, playing in the Super Bowl. I mean, I spent 15 years preparing for that, essentially every single day of my life. You know, practicing and refining and getting coaching. And comedy, it's more like you know, you don't have a coach. You don't. I mean, you can try some jokes out on your wife, right? But she doesn't think I'm funny because she's been with me forever. So uh, you go out there and you're like, well, I have no idea how this is going to go. So we'll see. We talked a little bit about John Randall, and you've played against some great athletes, great football players, and then you won your Super Bowl championship with the Baltimore Ravens, and one of the people that I think our audience would be interested in hearing a little bit about is Michael Orr. Yeah. Uh, he, he was the main character in the movie Blindside, and you were with him, and tell us a little bit about what you know of him, and is all that 
true, and I've heard mixed mixed things about that. So our audience yeah. is going to get a kick out of hearing that. Well, you know, Michael was uh, it was kind of funny because I got to Baltimore, and then they drafted him. So we got there the same year. We were both the new guys, and I had sort of heard, oh, they're making a movie about this guy, and you know, when you're a veteran, like you don't care, right? You're like, this is just some this is just some punk rookie, you know? And, oh, this guy's having a movie made about him. Oh, this guy, he's gonna <laughs> whatever hazing, you know, the normal level is, he's gonna get a double, right? First rounder, all that. Um, Mike showed up, couldn't have been a better, a better guy. I mean, shows up, no ego, mouth shut, tough. I mean, just did everything tough as could be, like instantly earned everybody's respect. You know, Mike's a, um, I consider Mike a, a great friend, played with him for four years, like just, you hear about it, and that the bond between football players and, and the team and, and all that, but I mean, Mike is a guy who, I don't have any more respect for anybody I ever played with than Mike just because of, of he literally laid it on the line every single day in practice, every game. I mean, just just gave it everything he had. And got to and The story I, I like to tell, I think that it gives you a good idea of what kind of person Mike is. I always prided myself on being the first one in the practice facility. I don't know, I just thought, hey, I'm a low-talent guy. I should just be the first one there. Like, I should have that, I should have that belt, right? Like, first guy in. And, uh, and plus, I was old, too. So, you know, you don't sleep as much when you're older. So I'm getting up <laughs> at 5 o'clock anyways. I might as well drive to the facility. And I, don't know, I probably get there like 6.15, 6.30. And, I, and Mike would, Mike, first day, Mike was already there. This is a rookie, you know, 20, first rounder. So the next day, I get there at 6.05. He's there. I get there at 6. He's there. And one time I beat him to the facility. I got there like five to six, and he comes running in. I was like, I beat you. Because you, there's nobody in the parking lot. Like, it was his car and nobody else. Well, this day my truck was there, and he came in. He's like, man, he goes, I overslept. He goes, my alarm didn't go off. He was all mad because I beat him to the facility. But that's, like, even though he was a first-rounder and, and, and all that, Mike had the mentality of a guy mm -hmm. that, like, hey, you know, like I did. Like, they're going to cut me. Every single day, they're, <laughs> you got to fight for your job. And, and now that just speaks to to Mike's character and certainly a, 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 an amazing personal story, you know, what he, what he's overcome in his life, you know, and that's a, that's a testament to him. And again, I always say life, everybody, it's a team game. Nobody gets to where they are by themselves. You need to have those, those people, coaches, parents, wh whoever it is, people that take an interest in you and, uh, and, and help you, you know, help, help get you through and, 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 and raise you up. And then, uh, and then, you know, when you become, in a position where you can do that for others, that's what that's what you need to do to honor and thank those people that, that did it for you when you were a kid. Now we're down to literally a minute. This is this may be the fastest half an hour interview that we've ever had. Um, Great, I'm glad you, you guys all didn't fall asleep. Uh, so so before we go, tell us do you do you still follow the NFL and do you ever miss the game? Well, I have to follow the NFL. I have five sons and a couple of them. You know, they, they basically grew up in Baltimore, so they're huge Ravens fans. So they, they love the Ravens. They keep me updated on what's going on at the Ravens. And then, you know, just being here, right, you can't escape Vikings news. And I do do some stuff around the team still. I mean, I, I, I love the game. I love the fact that my kids are into it, that they're playing now. I get to coach them. The game, aside from NFL and money and all that, I mean, the game can teach you some really important things. That's why I, that's why I love football. And I try to watch it as a fan, you know, try not to – just try to sit down and watch it, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard. Like, you guys have been around sports, and when you're on the inside, you know, I don't watch the ball. I'm watching the line, and I'm saying this. Yes. I, I can get so worked up so easily. I'm like, this game does not affect my life at all. Just relax and try to try to enjoy it as a fan, but it's but it's hard to do. Matt, thanks so much. Thank for my being pleasure, guys. I'm behind Anytime. the game. Yeah, for, for sure. It's a privilege. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching Behind the Game.